Welcome to episode 135 of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNUs. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. And if you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. Coming up on this week's episode, we're going to talk about the pretty nasty bug discovered in the sudo tool, which has been named Baron Semedit. I think I said that right. We've got some distro news to discuss Ubuntu 21.04 and Tails OS. Then we'll check out some news in the desktop environment space from KDE Plasma and CDE, the common desktop environment of all things. In app news, we'll check out the latest releases of Mozilla Firefox, XFCE's Thunar File Manager, and another browser called Cute Browser. Cute with a Q, naturally. We'll take a look at the exciting plans that UbiPorts has for Ubuntu Touch in 2021. And, well, this episode is just packed with so much this week. So let's just get jump right into it to your weekly source for Linux GNUs. First in the show, we have some interesting news related to some security news. And apparently, 007 couldn't stop Baron Samedit from affecting the security of your system. You know, James Bond, 007, anybody? Okay, so before we get into the details, let's talk about the name of the vulnerability because it's it's Baron Samedit. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I think it's that. It's a play on pseudo edit and Baron Samedi. Baron Samedi is a voodoo spirit and the Loa God of the Dead. As I was reading the article on frontpagelinux.com, Eric the IT guy explained that apparently... Baron Samedi was also used in a James Bond movie for some reason. I mean, these movies are so realistic, right? Of course, James Bond would battle against a mythical spirit with uh, chaotic powers and still somehow win. Anyway, let's get back on track with the real topic, and that is the uh, Baron Samedi pseudo vulnerability. So there was a pretty nasty bug discovered in pseudo tool by an information security and compliance company called Qualys Inc. I think that's how you say it. Uh, Sudo is used to elevate the privileges of a user to act as root while not actually being root. So as you would imagine, security bugs in this situation is not ideal. And this bug allows for unauthorized root level access to your Linux system. Now, this is a local attack only. So they have to already have access to your system to use this vulnerability. But once they do, then the system is kind of hosed without patching it. It's bad, but since it's not a remote attack vector, it's not as bad as it might sound, though still pretty bad. You essentially just need to update your system to have a pseudo 1.9.5p2 or newer, depending on your distribution. Some distributions have a different version number because they they patch their existing version, so it seems like the same version, but it's slightly different, and that's the past version. I'll, I'll tell you how, it, how to check for yourself if you are affected or not. In, uh, in a second, but first let's talk about how it works. So normally to gain ad- administrative levels access to a Linux system, you have to run a su command and provide the root password or have your account authorized in the uh, slash etsy slash sudoers file. The Baron Semedit bug utilizes a buffer overflow in the pseudo logic to allow a non-privileged account to bypass this security mechanism and run commands with root level privileges. While running a pseudo command in shell mode, either with the tacs or the tacI argument, special characters must be escaped with a backslash character. With this vulnerability, however, you can add an extra backslash to any command, and this will cause pseudo to skip the policy review step where it reads the etsy slash reviewer section, and this is how it checks to ensure the executing account has pseudo privileges. So essentially... By skipping this step, it provides root-level access to anyone on the machine to run any command they want to. So, yeah, not good. Obviously, this is not an ideal piece of news, but it is important to cover to make sure that everyone out there in the Dylan community, or perhaps the Twillerverse, can be aware to update their systems. So how do you know if you are affected by this vulnerability? Well, well, that part is really easy, actually. Uh, Everyone is affected, so... Uh, You may already have received the patch, though, because the rollout of the fix has already happened and it happened very quickly. In order to check if you are affected, it's a very simple process. Just run the command that is, I'll list it in the show notes, but it's basically just sudo edit space tac s tac, or no, space slash. And this, if this works in terms of being affected, it will give you a result that says sudo edit. 
So if it returns the pseudo edit info information, it, then the system is vulnerable. If it returns the word usage and then provides inf information related to, to pseudo edit in general, that means your system is patched. At this point, it has been a few days uh, as you're listening, so you should have the patch available in your system already as the responsible Linux distros have already deployed the patch. When I went to test to see if I was affected, I had, before I even heard of the bug, I had updated my system and it was already patched. So that was nice. And so you should be able to just update your system to get the latest security patches and be totally fine. You should update and then run the command to check to make sure anyway, of course, you know, just so you know for a fact that it is patched. And if you want to learn more about this vulnerability, then I recommend checking out the great article on it at frontpagelinux.com. I'll have it linked in the show notes. And if you want the technical details, I will have that in the show notes as well. Have you ever heard of the Common Desktop Environment, or CDE as it is more easily said, which I will continue to use from this point forward. Well, if not, it was the first desktop environment available, one of the first anyway, available for computing. CDE is a desktop environment for Unix and OpenVMS based on the Motif Widget Toolkit, and its first version was released in 1993. It was part of the Unix 98 workstation product standard and was for a long time the classic Unix desktop associated with commercial Unix workstations. It was actually proprietary DE up until 2012, which explains why no one outside of big corporations bothered to use it, and also explains why you may not have even heard of it before now. So why am I talking about CDE in 2021? Well, apparently it's still being developed, and that's kind of crazy, so I wanted to let people know if they want to check it out. A blog post written by Ramey Van Helst, I'm pro I probably messed that up, sorry. Uh, he talked about like the ability to uh, still install it and, and trying out and like a tutorial about how to do that. I mean, it's it's really cool because apparently running on modern day Linux systems is possible. And I mean, of course, it's not you know remotely a modern DE by any stretch of the imagination. And it can, t but it can technically still work, which is kind of fascinating to me. I I, I kind of want to try it out myself just to see how it runs with my computer, just because I I expect it to be a fun experience while also being a problematic experience because, well, there's a lot of compiling to do in this particular setup and install process. Uh, Rami's blog post tells you all about how to install it on your system and that sort of stuff. And once you're done with having it set up, you have a brand new setup with CDE. And of course, brand new in this case is a relative term. It still looks like CDE is stuck in the mid-1990s in terms of visuals, and probably a bit more than that, but I do think it's pretty cool. You could call it like so ret like so ancient it becomes retro, so like retro tech. I don't know. If you want more information about this on CDE in general or check out the tutorial, I'll have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show, there is a new version of the Tails Linux distro released this week. And yes, the pseudo patch we talked about earlier is included in this latest release. And for those who aren't aware, Tails is an acronym for the Amnesic Incognito Live System. That is fun to say. This rolls right off the tongue. Hence, Tails. Uh, Tails is a portable Linux-based operating system that protects against surveillance and censorship. This latest release has an update uh, for the Linux kernel of 5.9.15, which should pr improve the support for newer hardware for stuff like graphics, Wi-Fi, and those sorts of things. They also updated the Tor browser to 10.0.9 and updated Thunderbird to 78.6.0. Now, I admit this bit of news isn't that exciting, but it has been a while since I talked about Tails on the show. The last time I talked about it was episode 92? Wait, what? It's been almost a year since I covered Tails on this show. Huh. Anyway, if you're interested in a privacy-based operating system, then Tails is certainly worth checking out. And in fact, if you want some more details on this particular topic, then you should watch Ryan, aka Dos Geek's video on Tails that's on his channel. I'll have a link in the show notes for that. It's a great run rundown of what Tails is and why you should consider using it. So I'll have a link to the latest release for the uh, release notes for the latest uh, 4.15 of Tails, as well as the video that Ryan made in the show notes. 
This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their new app platform service. DigitalOcean's app platform service is a solution to build modern cloud-native apps. Use a simple, intuitive, and visually rich experience to rep- rapidly build, deploy, manage, and scale apps. It has support for Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, Docker, and container images. Highly, it has high scalability. It has zero infrastructure management. But what does that mean? Well, to simply put it, it, you can point your GitHub or your GitLab repository and let the app platform do all the heavy lifting for you. Let it handle the infrastructure like app runtimes and dependencies so that you can push code to production in just a few clicks. It also can help you with security automatically. They create, manage, and renew your SSL certificates and also protect your apps from DDoS attacks. So you can run code with little to no customization. App platform uses open cloud native standards and automatically analyzes your code, creates containers, and and runs them on Kubernetes clusters. And as a listener of the This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started on the app platform for free. Well, better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform. I want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is the beta release of KDE Plasma 5.21. So they announced this beta release, and I am so excited for 5.21. For those of you who aren't aware, I am a KDE fan, and I have been using KDE Plasma for over seven years now as my daily driver desktop environment, and it just keeps getting better and better. And this is not an exception to that. It is just getting better. There's a lot of cool stuff in KDE Plasma 5.21. But since this is just a beta release, I won't cover everything or go super deep into the whole uh, release and everything like that. I will just mostly do the uh, highlights for this particular thing. But I will be going into much more detail and when, when the final release comes out. So be sure to subscribe if you want more of that. So KDE Plasma 5.21 has had a lot of work on polishing support for Wayland, which is certainly exciting with extensive improvements to KWIN's uh, Wayland compositing code, as well as support for mixed refresh rate display configurations, among other Wayland improvements. Uh, 5.21 also features a change to the system settings tool where you will find that you can now configure your firewall settings directly in system settings. There's also a new system monitor tool called Plasma system monitor. I mean, it's not the most unique names, but it does look pretty sweet for a system monitor. It has a very nice modern design and the plasma system monitor provides many different views for information. It has an overview page that provides information on important core resource resources like memory, disk space, network, CPU usage, and more stuff. It also provides a quick view of the applications consuming the most resources, which is really nice. Uh, And there's also some other stuff like various Plasma mobile enhancements in this release, which is very cool. But there are two items that I have saved for last because, well, you'll you'll see. There is a new application launcher built into KDE Plasma 5.21. It has a double pane UI, improvements to keyboard and mouse navigation, better accessibility, and support for languages with right-to-left writing style. The new launcher includes an alphabetical all-applications view and a nice grid-style favorites view for this double-pane UI. This is such a welcome change. Uh, I've honestly never been a fan of the kickoff menu, the previous one that has been default for a long time. I always switch to kicker because that one just always felt a lot smoother experience. So this is why I am excited for this new menu because it's essentially a combination of kickoff and kicker making a better, more modern menu. So I am very, very excited about that and I can't wait to try it out. So the next thing let's talk about that the one that I'm the most excited about to tell you uh, is Breeze Twilight. Breeze Twilight is a new theme included in KDE Plasma 5.21 that is a combination of dark and light elements. Essentially, what this does is it applies dark elements to the Plasma desktop panels and menus and that sort of stuff, and it uses light elements for the applications. I have been wanting KDE to do this for many years now, and to see it happening... Um, Hold on a second. Yes! Okay, I can't wait to try this one out. I am very excited. Uh, Kubuntu try, uh, introduced this styling in K- uh, Kubuntu 18.04 a few years ago. This was when I first started contributing to Kubuntu, and there was one of the big things that I wanted Kubuntu to do at the time. So seeing this concept being 
put officially into KDE, that making it themselves for all distros to have as an option is just, yes. Okay, okay. Now that I've calmed down, I should probably remind you, and also myself, that this is a, pay, a beta release. KDE Plasma 5.21 is still in beta. So you may want to wait a bit before you try it or know that you're going to be trying a testing version. But if you want to try it out, which I do and I will, you can find a link in for the announcement in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about the exciting plans that the UbiPorts team have for 2021 related to Ubuntu Touch. So for those who don't know, UbiPorts is the team behind Ubuntu Touch project, which is an effort to make a Linux mobile operating system. Also, real quick, while Ubuntu Touch does use the Ubuntu name, it and it was originally created and developed by Canonical slash Ubuntu, it is now a completely community-controlled project by the UbiPorts team, and Canonical has very little to do, if anything, with it. Uh, Canonical discontinued their work on it in 2017, and that is when UbiPorts team stepped in and took over. While they still use the Ubuntu Touch name, you may be asking why. Well, that's a that's a good question. So in episode 92 of Ubuntu Touch Q&A, the UbiPorts team do, does they do this thing to keep people up to date with what's going on in the project, which is really cool. And they discuss the plans for 2021. And there is some exciting stuff in there. First of all, let's talk about Lomiri. Lomiri is the rebranded name of the Unity 8 desktop environment that UbiPorts works on. And I am so excited to see that there is progress on this front. It's not super fast progress, but it's progress and progress is progress. It's also cool that they are working with Manjaro in a joint a joint effort to improve the DE and get it ready for prime time. So that is really cool. But for now, Lomiri is still in a bleeding edge type of situation and is under heavy development. So if you want to try it out, keep that in mind. Uh, UE ports also, uh, these developers talk about moving towards using uh, Ubuntu 20.04 as the long-awaited package base to see the aging Ubuntu 16.04, which is really cool because the developers are hoping in the first half of this year that they will be able to begin the transition from 16.04 to 20.04 LTS as their base platform, which is great news because it's, it's a very exciting one, in fact, because it improves uh, performance and hardware compatibility value and all sorts of stuff, so I'm looking forward to that a lot. UbiPorts installer also has some new features that are announced and planned. So for stuff already available, the installer is now able to unlock the bootloader of some devices automatically in fast boot mode. This is great because it makes it a lot easier to install Ubuntu Touch. It was already an easy to use in the UbiPorts installer, but now it's better on the supported devices because you don't have to deal with as much prep work prior to installing it. So that is very cool. For the plans that they have, they said that they've added steps for installing Asteroid OS. And if you haven't heard of Asteroid OS, that's a watch operating system. So they say that they are interested in modifying the installer to run that as well with the intention to have a Swiss Army Knife approach, which means it would be uh, no longer limited to just installing Ubuntu Touch. And that is really, really interesting. The UbiPorts team also talked about how they are working with Upstream Mirror team for getting Ubuntu Touch on Mirror 2.x branch for the event eventual goal of smoothly running on Wayland. There's so much more in this Q&A as well, such as discussions on the Pine phone and many other things. So if you want to learn more about UbiPorts or Ubuntu Touch, I suggest checking that out. I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show, let's talk about Mozilla's Firefox. Some of you may know that I'm a pretty big fan of Firefox. I have been a Firefox user since the days it was called Phoenix and Firebird. Back then, there weren't many options for browsers that were any good, so Firefox was a very welcomed addition to the computing world since otherwise you pretty much only had Internet Explorer. Anyway, uh, this week, Mozilla announced the release of Firefox 85, and there are some really cool things included in it. As a quick reminder, uh, Firefox 85 is the first release to drop support for Adobe Flash Player plugin. We talked about that in the last uh, t- uh, release for 84 as well, but this is the first one that doesn't have it, which makes sense because and uh, Adobe dropped support for it in- already, and keeping support for technology when the developers and maintainers of it have abandoned it wouldn't be the wisest thing to do, so it makes sense that they would. Uh, Firefox 85 also added the ability to remove all of your saved logins very easily from the built-in password manager rather than having to delete each one individually as it was before. Now, why is this a feature worth talking about? Well, it makes it easier to transition to Bitwarden password manager for one, and uh, more on that later. 
But the big thing in this latest release is a very cool feature that you won't even have to do anything to utilize because it will be happening automatically in the background. Mozilla has always been a proponent for privacy and security, so it makes sense that they would continue to work on that front, and Firefox 85 is no exception to that. Uh, Firefox 85 comes with a major privacy feature called network partitioning, which promises to improve your privacy while browsing the web by partitioning the network resources instead of sharing them to eliminate cross-site tracking. So what does this mean exactly? The feature is based on the client-side storage partitioning, which is a new standard currently being developed by the W3C. In addition to cookies, there are other storage mechanisms that can be used to track people across various websites, such as HTTP cache, image cache, uh, fav, fav icon cache, uh, font cache, cores, preflight cache, and a variety of other caches and storage mechanisms. The network partitioning will allow Firefox to save resources like cache, fav icons, C CSS files, images, and more on a per website basis rather than all together in the same pool of data. This makes it harder for websites and third party sites to, or ads like web analytics and stuff like that, those kinds of companies to track users since they can't probe the presence of data from other sites. According to Mozilla, they will be partition partitioning off 18 different types of storage mechanisms to address this. Mo Mozilla also said that, that a side effect of deploying network partitioning is that, what's well, a good side effect, but it's that Firefox 85 will be able to block super cookies better, a type of browser cookie file that abuses various shared storage mechanisms and even sticks around after you clear your cookies. So those are kind of annoying and it's really great that they have some like a side effect, a good side effect to stop that. So very cool. Uh, there's been a little bit of a downside though. Since website data will now be downloaded for each top level domain, it will take a little longer to load websites. Now, not a lot longer. Uh, Mozilla says that the performance impact should be negligible for most users and you probably won't even notice, but the tests say that only 0.09% to about 1% hit will be experienced. And personally, I think that's totally acceptable for such a great privacy feature being added. So that is very cool. Now, uh, Chrome also uh, introduced something about a month ago or so, something like that, and it's similar not to, to the degree that Firefox did, and the same thing is true for Apple's Safari. They have something similar, but Firefox went much, much more beyond that, so very cool to see that kind of work. Now, there are some, there's something I wanted to tell you about in terms of Firefox, because the, the news this week isn't all good stuff to talk about. We also have something, well, honestly, it's annoying and... An example of Firefox missing a big opportunity for awesomeness that's uh, pretty disappointing to me. On Firefox's Bugzilla, there was a thread about removing SSBs, aka site-specific browser support, from Firefox. This is very annoying to me. This is something I was looking forward to for so long when I saw it show up in the command line options for Firefox. But, you know, for those who don't know, uh, SSB or site-specific browser allowed you to load up a window of Firefox separate from the main instance, but also not use any of the interface elements of the browser itself, effectively making it look like a separate application. I admittedly, the feature implemented in Firefox wasn't polished or even easy to find since you had to know that you had to look at the command line options, but to see it at all, so, you know... But to see it go away is just lame. It's just lame. To quote the developer who started the thread for removal, it's, it says, user research found little to no perceived user benefit to the feature. And so there is no intent to continue development on it at this time. So my first question is, no user benefit. Hmm. How about being able to create your own desktop apps using web apps, which is very cool. And yes, please, user benefit. There you go. Found one for you. Also, when asked what user research was meant and what they were referring to, well, they they didn't clarify. So, they doesn't what use who knows. I don't know. This is also something that Google's Chromium and Chrome have had for a long time, uh, but unfortunately, Google's implementation is also lame. So. Chrome's version of SSBs function in the same basic way that Firefox's did with the fundamentals only. Uh, but the difference between Google's approach and uh, Firefox's approach is that Google put it in the UI so people could find it. So, you know, there's that. Uh, what makes it lame, though, because you're probably wondering why I think 
there's this is annoying and disappointing that they got rid of it. Well, the problem is that both of these Im- implementations had is the the session they were using sh- were shared across all SSBs. If you create two SSBs of the same website for Twitter, for example, so you want to be able to, to log into two different accounts at once. Well, that wouldn't work because those share the same session data and thus both would be logged into the same account. So it really defeats the point, and that's why they are currently lame. Now, they have a lot of potential to be amazing because, you know, here's the thing. Firefox could have made this amazing. All they had to do was connect their SSBs to their container tabs and bam, epicness. For those who don't know, Container Tabs, or Multi-Account Containers, is an extension that Mozilla made for Firefox, which allows you to isolate session data into containers so that you can separate different accounts and then be able to use this in different tabs in the same browser window. It's kind of hard to really explain fully in a podcast form, but just know it is amazing and awesome and the best feature and the number one reason I use Firefox because it's awesome. Um, actually, check out the videos linked in the show notes I, for, for my reasons of why I use Firefox because the actually the number one reason is the container tabs. So you can check it out, more details about what it is. And I also demonstrate how it works and that sort of thing. So you can get a better rundown of what they are and how they work. And I also did a more in-depth video on just container tabs as well, which features a lot more, you know, more information about it as well. So I'll have those, both of those linked in the show notes if you want to check it out. Anyway, take the SSBs and combine them with container tabs and you have a a recipe for web app gold. It would be so cool. But sadly, this is but a dream. Now, I don't want to end the topic on a down note, though. So before we move on, this is something cool coming in Firefox 86, and that is multiple instances of picture-in-picture pop-out videos. So that is pretty cool. You can have multiple videos popped out from the screen at the same time, and you'll be able to, you know, see, be able to do it a lot more than just videos and stuff like that. It's 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 pretty interesting. We'll we'll check it out in the future, but we'll talk about that when 86 is released. Uh, but you know, there you go. If you'd like to learn more about the items I covered for this particular topic, check the links in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. A password manager is software that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. So how does it do that? Well, securing your online accounts is very important because the best security practice is for having a different password for every account on every website that you sign up to. Sure, this makes sense as a policy, but also without a password manager, it's a pretty painful thing to do. Bitwarden solves this by providing tools to store all of your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to. You can access your data across multiple types of devices like your web browser using their mobile apps, desktop applications, or even the command line. And with their new biometric features, you can get access to your data even easier. The biometric options are rolling out for uh, Bitwarden browser plugins and Bitwarden desktop app, and this will let you access your vault with a fingerprint, face recognition, and other forms of biometric authentication. Very awesome. And Bitwarden performs this end-to-end encryption on your data before it ever leaves yours de- those devices, so you know you're the only person with access to your data. However, there may be a point in the future where you might want someone to have access to your data, like under critical circumstances, for for example. This is where Bitwarden's new emergency access feature comes in. Emergency access offers a way to grant someone's access to your vault if you can no longer access it yourself. This feature makes doing a digital handoff to a friend or a loved one simpler in emergency situations. So Bitwarden is a fantastic password manager, and I use it and trust it because all these features, as well as the fact that it is 100% open source software. That's right, 100% open source software. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention you can get started for free? Well, you can. But I also think you want to check out their premium account because you get a bunch of really cool features like one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden, Authenticator, uh, TOTP, Temporary One-Time Passwords, uh, Priority Customer Support, and more. And you get all this for less than $1 per month. That's right, less than $1 per month. Make the smart move like many from the DLN community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. This lets you get peace of mind for your passwords and other sensitive data while also supporting a company that truly gets open source. Sign up for their less than $1 per, per month premium account 
and let them know that you appreciate them supporting open source and supporting the This Week in Linux podcast. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started, and thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is XFCE's Thunar File Manager has had a release for 4.17.0. Thunar is XFCE's file manager, and it has been long been known as a very lightweight solution, but in order to do that lightweightness, they didn't include some of those some features that people who are spoiled by Dolphin, for example, like myself, want some of these features. But one and one of those features is coming with this latest release, and that is the split pane view. So you can have one window with the file manager open, yet have two folders loaded side by side. This new version will also support some additional features like unified sort menu that can also be used for detailed view, the ability to display all available volumes by default, the ability to always create new files and folders in the current directory that you're in, as well as support for submenus for custom actions, which is really awesome. Uh, being able to make your own custom actions for submenus, submenus inside of the file manager is something that I really, really wanted, so that's awesome. This will be a part of the XFCE 4.18 desktop environment release, which will be uh, coming out pretty, you know, well, we don't know exactly, but fairly soon, I hope. But this is in the early development stage right now, and this kind of stuff happening in the early process of the development if this kind of thing is happening, I mean, I can't wait to see what happens next because I, I think XFCE is on a roll. Like they, they started imp improving their uh, release cadence, making more stuff much faster, which is awesome to see. So if you'd like to learn more about XFCE or Th uh, Thunar, I'll have links for, for you in the show notes below about both so you can check out the DE and their file manager. Up next in the show, we're going to be talking about Ubuntu 21.04. Ubuntu is looking to use Wayland as the default display manager protocol for Ubuntu 2104. And this is quite interesting because the discussion about whether or not Wayland is ready is, is a big one. Uh, Ubuntu testing this as a default is going to be a big test to see if it is ready for an LTS. For those who don't know, LTS means uh, long-term support, and Ubuntu releases these long-term support versions every two years. So the next LTS will be in 2022 for 2204. Another note for those who don't know, Wayland is a, proje a project to replace Xorg as the display manager in Linux. Xorg has been around for decades, and Wayland is the in the development to replace it. And it has been in development for quite a long time, but not as long. <laughs> but it hasn't seen a ton of mainstream adoption yet, and arguably for good reason, because, for example, NVIDIA support is not there. Anyway... This is not the first time that Ubuntu tested Wayland by default in their release. They also did it in Ubuntu 17.10 cycle many years ago. It was like the first version where they were introducing GNOME, so they wanted to test it and that's an, that sort of thing. But uh, on the Ubuntu Discourse forum, Sebastian Bacher, I probably said that wrong. Sorry if I did. In the quote him on the post for this this particular thread says that in, in in Ubuntu 17.10 cycle we tried Wayland as a default session but we didn't feel confident at the time that it was ready yet for an LTS. Things improved since some of the blockers we found back then got resolved like desktop sharing and that's where the upstream focus is going. We believe now is the right time to try again. It should give us enough time before the next LTS to get proper feedback and sort out issues. Since we decided to not upgrade our GNOME version this cycle it should also make things a bit easier. And note that NVIDIA users are still going to default to Xorg for now, but hopefully that situation will be resolved before the LTS. Now, in terms of that, that's kind of up to NVIDIA, whether they want to play ball or not. So there's that. Uh, but it is very interesting. I, I'm cautiously optimistic about this because I have been wanting Wayland to be ready to go for, you know, like at least five years now. So I, I hope it is. However, I don't really know if it is. I mean, personally, there are a lot of stuff still not available in terms of the features like, comparable to what we have with X and that sort of stuff. So for my particular use case anyway. Uh, so again, I hope I'm wrong about that. Uh, and so looking forward to see what happens here. And I'll keep uh, I'll keep you posted in the future episode to reveal the re results of what happened with this test and if they continue to test it for uh, 2110 and that kind of thing. So I, I hope... I hope I'm wrong about it not being ready. I'm cautiously optimistic that it might be. So we'll see. If you'd like to read more on the forum thread for this for yourself, I'll have it linked in the show notes below. 
Up next in the show, let's talk about the Qt browser. The Qt browser has the latest release. It's a big release. It's a big major version of 2.0.0 has been released this week. And the Qt browser is a keyboard focused browser with a minimal GUI. It's based on Python and PyQt 5 and it's free software licensed under the GPL. It was inspired by other uh, browser add-ons and stuff like that, like Vimperator and Pentadactyl. So you have very high key, uh, keyboard driven stuff with you know, Vim variants and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of new features in this particular release. The Qt browser can now integrate with Brave's Rust ad blocker library for improved ad blocking based on the ABP-like uh, filter lists, such as EasyList. Uh, the new Qt, or Q, uh, Qt, but Qt, that's how you're supposed to say it, but for, you to, for those who don't know, Qt.environ setting, which makes it easy to set and unset environmental variables for Qt browser, which is really nice because it allows you to have a lot more control on your uh, on the browser with the variables for your environment your desktop environment which is really cool uh, the new settings to use an external file picker such as Ranger or VIFM which is Vi file manager uh, also there's new user scripts available so you can play videos in Kodi thanks to one of the scripts you can also generate a QR code with the current URL which is really nice and it has some Nextcloud integration stuff so you can create bookmarks and add recipes to the different apps in Nextcloud so very cool a uh, cute browser has had many contributors over the years uh, but it's primarily developed by one person and his name I'm probably going to pronounce the last name wrong so I apologize in advance but Florian Bruce something like that, uh, but also AKA the compiler. Now, did I, did I just tell you that stuff to, to make a Terminator type reference? Of course not. I mean, maybe a little, but also to let you know that there is some many projects like this that take up a lot of work to make. And also this work takes a lot of time. If you find value in projects like this or really any project, be sure to donate to those projects to help them continue being developed. I mean, I, I love open source, but one of the downsides is that there, there's not a lot of money in it when you're not dealing with the enterprise level of stuff. So if you want whatever project you enjoy using to continue to be made, be sure to donate to them. And now with that said, if you'd like to learn more about Cute Browser or just check it out for yourself in general, then um, you guessed it, link in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the show and the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And if you become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium. That's right, the recording stadium to discuss stuff between topics and just to hang out every week after the show in the patron post show. You can also order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, which is a shirt I made to, to convey the message that whether or not you know Linux is there, it probably is. Uh, you can check that out at the dlnstore.com. And if also, if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from, from me, then check out the latest episodes of Destination Linux and Hard Radix, as I'm a co-host of those shows on the Destination Linux network. So go to destinationlinux.network to check those out. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week by going to dlnlive. Dot com. That's right, dlnlive.com. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux news.